Um, one question that I ask is, would you mind if I share my super loose concept sketches with you for your eyes only? Don't take them to the team. They're going to be really bad, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page before I really start to, to focus in and, and refine sketches just to know if I'm even close with the concept that you have left me with. Now, this is if they, if they give you a story and they're like, have at it. We want to see what you're thinking, you know. Then I really just want to show them what I'm thinking in a visual representation, and I keep it really super loose. Mm -hmm. um, um, I ask them for a template so that I get the size right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for all the major publications in the business. Together, we've published somewhere around... 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. That's right. Each week we take different questions from our listeners, or we interview fantastic, super famous illustrators, uh, and we talk about all kinds of stuff. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. We got a treat today. John Hendricks is the illustrator of the hour. Um, we just had a delightful uh, conversation with him. And he's like the thing that, um, that really got me, I've been following his work for years and I'm so glad that the man behind it is just as like thoughtful, just as introspective, just as gracious and uh, clear as his illustrations are. Mm -hmm. Had you guys seen his work or were you, you said you were somewhat familiar with him before we talked today, yeah. right? What was your experience yeah. with his stuff before? Uh, um, just, go? yeah, just seeing it, just seeing the, the books on the shelves and, you know, I see him post and, and you know, he wins a bunch of awards and stuff. He's mm -hmm. got this really loose, uh, uh, organic style. That's just amazing. He integrates type and image in a way that's, I'm honestly, I'm jealous of it. Like I've looked at his pages and I love hand on type and I'm just, but I'm not very good at hand on type. Um, and he's just really, really good at it. Uh, so he's just got this energy and he just seems like a, uh, a, a dude who knows what he's doing. And then he's, he's always, uh, very visible cause he's like, you know, spearheading icon or, you know, he's doing these big things. So he's just kind of a heavy hitter in the community, you know? Yeah. That's what I'm most impressed by is, uh, you know, like I had seen his work, but I hadn't really paid much attention i did right away you know um early on see his uh, influence from jack unra mm -hmm. um, as jack unra was uh one of my hero illustrators and i actually got to meet him before he passed away but um i didn't have any idea how prolific he was until i saw his website and prepping for this podcast to be honest and also i had no idea that he was into so many things. I mean, I'm, we didn't find out if he's married and with, with kids or anything, but <laughs> I mean, I can't, and he looks so young. I can't believe what he's accomplished in the amount of time he's been doing this. I mean, it's, I know crazy. I wanted to keep it under an, or to the hour that we right. told him, but I was going to ask him like, he's so prolific. I want to know if it's like deceptively prolific. Like, is he just cranking out a masterpiece every day or if it's just, he's been at it for so long, that it seems well, like. And running the M MFA program and, mm -hmm. and, and Seriously. the, uh, like you said, Lee, the, the, um, chairman of icon conference. I mean, just like everything that he's done, all the awards he's won. It's incredible. Well, I don't think it hurts that he has a style that is conducive to speed um, mm -hmm. I definitely don't think that's, that's a drawback. You know that's what I true. mean? Like, you think his style is quick? Well, I do. I, I think, I think it probably takes, it reminds me not necessarily of the way it looks with my style, but, uh, but just the working, the way that I work is that if I get it right quick, it's very, 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 very fast. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the sketches don't go that way though. <laughs> sometimes, I mean? sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree. <laughs> I mean, some of these look like they take forever. He's very detailed, though. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Yeah. He gets it. He gets in there and uh, kind of noodles it, noodles stuff. Anyway. So, anyways, check know. out his work at johnhendricks.com. You can follow him at uh, his Twitter handle, 
which where is that at? It's Hendrix Art, I believe is what it is. Uh, let me just get up here. Yeah, Hendrix Art uh, on Twitter and I believe on Instagram as well. So without further ado, let's get into our interview with John Hendrix. Did you guys happen to see um, Avatar 2, Way of Water? I was looking it into it and then I saw that it was three hours and 12 minutes and I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting until that's streaming. I'm not watching that all in one go. But you just got to imagine that it's three episodes uh, of television that are an hour each and you're just right. going to, you're just going to be, but yeah, yeah, you can't get up. Television show. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you got to sit there. <laughs> Lee, you got to see it in the theater. Yeah. All right. That's the thing. I sort of knew that I did, but you got it. It's, so let me tell you, I'm going to warn you too. Slight spoiler. Our no. episode, episode two of the three episode series that is Avatar 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> episode Limited two. series. Yeah. Did you see it, John? No, I haven't. I'd like oh, okay. to. Okay. I'll just say this the middle section is nothing story wise happens for about an hour, but you don't care because it's so gosh darn beautiful. You're just like, I just want to sit here on this coral reef and just. <laughs> it's know. an open world uh, video game. You're just, yeah. Honestly, honestly. So. I heard but, somebody describe it uh, as the reverse problem of the Star Wars prequels, where they were incredibly interesting stories that were kind of doomed by subpar filmmaking. And that <laughs> Avatar is like an OK story that's elevated by like superior filmmaking uh mm. which i yeah. thought was take but yeah i yeah. really do want to hear. yeah i mean avatar one and two both it's i mean you're, you're they're not shakespeare for sure right, right. but they are a wild ride that's for sure um okay so let's let's get down to it you're recording now lee so we're good we're good to go yep, i'm recording and you're just gonna be watercoloring <laughs> yeah <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. And okay. he'll he'll text his contractors and stuff right. like that. And then if if we see Lee get up and leave, he's just working out really quick. He'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Uh, John Hendricks, uh, great to ha- great to have you on the show here. I I'm going to come out of the gate with uh, just uh, this question, and I want to know how did you find this niche that you're in, which essentially is. Um, biographical children's books or young adult books, um, you know, in the landscape of illustration, was this something you were compelled to do or is this something that came to you and you just like, oh, I'll try it out and you enjoyed it. Do you even enjoy it? And you want to get out of this niche? Tell yeah. us a b- little bit about how'd you get into that? It, like a lot of things that happen in our careers, it it almost feels like luck guided a lot of what happened to us. Um, now, of mm-hmm. course, the things that you don't see are all the things you're trying to figure out and to do. And what feels like luck is probably really just you aligning your own practice with what the market sees in your work when we're talking about, you know, trade books. Mm -hmm. So for me, I ended up in biographies in what feels like an accident in that I was reading, I love history. I I love nonfiction. Um, Mm -hmm. um, So, I mean, I love fiction too, but I was reading a bunch of books about John Brown, the abolitionist when I was in graduate school. And I wanted to be Chris Van Allsburg. I mean, I I wanted to be kind of lush realism in children's books. I wrote all these sort of fantastical, visually rich stories that were wordless, you know, um, and I, I just could not find my way into the market in that, in that place. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure that had anything to do with what I was, um, creating at the time, but when I, I started to write this book about John Brown for kids, uh, you know, it unlocked something in my own work. It unlocked something in the market, you know, it, it, it found an audience. Um, and, and that's always the story when you're making books for young people in a trade environment is like, how does your work meet an audience? And it just, it, it found a a space. It found people that wanted to read them. Uh, and then I just happened to be, to make really good work when I was in that space. Uh, and so those, that, that's kind of what making a book career is about, I think. 
Mm. What happened before John Brown? What were you doing before that? So I, I worked, I, I graduated from University of Kansas with a degree in visual communications. I went to work as a graphic designer. I worked in PR in a, in a giant corporation, which was a total disaster. I just was not made for corporate life. <laughs> I, I was, I think I was barely not fired. I, I, I quit right ahead of being fired. Uh, <laughs> and then went to graduate school in New York City at SVA to really, uh, I need a deadline. I need a sense of panic. And, you know, taking <laughs> $80,000 in loans was like, okay, I, I have to make this work. Um, and so it was when I got to New York and, and started trying to do it for real um, that that it became kind of my career. And, and, I, and I started an editorial. You know, I, I wanted to do books my whole life. But in New York, editorial is, you know, relatively easy to get. There's a lot of opportunity to meet people in that space. And so that's that's how I cut my teeth and learned how to make visual ideas was in the editorial space. And then I, I met David Saylor, uh, who art directed all the Harry Potter books and, and had a great meeting with him. And that's when I pitched my John Brown idea. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's those little bricks in the wall, one one, you know, meeting at a time that, that you make a career. Uh, of course, most students hate to hear that. They want to know the secret formula. And, <laughs> it's never anything like that. So what, you what can, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What year did you were you doing editorial? So I, I got to New York in 2001 and my, my very first editorial job was for the Village Voice in 2001. And um, so that's when I started. And, and I was almost entirely editorial up until 2009, when my, my first book came out. Mm. And then I've still done it over the years and enjoy it. Um, but it, it has not been my primary, um, the, the primary thing I work on throughout the year for for quite some time. And the re one of the reasons why I ask is, um, you, I saw on your website that you uh, were the president of Icon, one of the you, you chaired, or I, I can't remember the, the terminology. Mm -hmm. You were the grand poobah of the grand poobah. Yeah, that's of, exactly of, it. of yeah. the uh, one of the icons. And if I'm not mistaken, that one started with um, with the the um, illustrators partnership guys, right? The it was the, the Brad uh, Holland and Chris that Payne. Yeah, that was really founded in the late 90s to, to fight stock illustration and, right. and the fear of stock being this specter that would would hurt editorial work. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's where I I was at that first conference. And, oh, uh, no kidding. I was on was on a panel unprepared. And uh, <laughs> um, that's a long story. But but basically, um, no, it's, it's interesting because I could see the editorial. Um, the, I could see your work in editorial and. So when you mentioned that, I was like, oh, and, and at the time it was editorial was really diving. So that's, that's, that's interesting. Well, well, and editorial was in a moment where it was moving from the, the Gary Kelly, very rich painterly editorial work into stuff that was more influenced by comics, mm -hmm. you know, um, Tomer Hanuka and Yuko Shimizu and Nathan Fox all you know, we're coming up about the time I was where line driven editorial work was finding um, a home in the New York Times and, and the New Yorker outside of the cover, you know. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of an era of transition that I was able to, uh, you know, sneak into in a way. Yeah. So go and back did to. You, did you always add, add, add type to, I mean, you seem very type and image driven to where they work together. Was that always there or is that did, did, was that at the it, suggestion of somebody? I, it, what's hilarious is I didn't think of that as a feature. I thought of it as kind of a bug early on <laughs> in, that, in that I needed the type to, to make the image work for me. Uh, I love type. I studied design in undergrad. Um, I, I studied Bradbury Thompson, who was this design illustrator guy from the 60s. And the idea of type as image became just essential to my workflow. And, and then, you know, art directors kept saying like, well, I love the drawing, but I really love the type. And so th then I began to think, oh, this is something that can be used. And of course, like, why didn't I put that together? It's extremely useful and functional mm -hmm. as a career option to be able to do the type on a book jacket and basically put the art director completely out of business and just, you know, own every portion of the book, the jacket, the spine, the flaps. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that, that became part of how I worked, but it was, it was really totally just intuitive. Mm. 
That's an that's incredible. I I want to. There's a little nugget there where you said that Icon was created uh, because of the fear of stock illustration, right? And I, by extension, too. I mean, photographers are were worried about stock mm-hmm. photography. That kind of sheds a little bit of light, I think, on our current situation where there's a lot of fear and panic about AI art mm-hmm. as well. I'm wondering, like, what how did you survive as an illustrator with the onslaught of stock illustration sort of like creeping in and, and I I assume taking some jobs or, or, you know, taking some opportunities. What, what was your sort of lessons learned from that time period? Uh, So I think looking back on the fear that stock put into the illustration community back then um, Mm -hmm. was a a little unfounded. I mean, it was right to to have a united front and say, we as illustrators making our best work believe this is not the best way <laughs> to mm-hmm. conduct our industry. And I do really think that bled over into the very best art directors, the very best publications would never be caught dead using this stuff because mm-hmm. it was mostly mediocre. You know, it was right. just fine. And mm-hmm. so I think if you... I could never, I don't think much of what people are calling me for could be replaced with stock because Mm -hmm. what I'm being asked to do is so very specific. Mm -hmm. So I I think similar to AI, the, the, the very best work will never be threatened by that. It's, it's going to be stuff that's towards the lower half Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, So I'm not really making a value judgment on that. I just think that, that approaching AI with this fear that the world is, is uh, the sky is falling is is probably a little panic, um, a little too panicky. That that's not to say that there are not real issues and and uh, right. We have to have a united front against it. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I I generally think that <laughs> human creativity and people making original things is just that I I don't see how that could ever be truly threatened. But right. I, I mean, we've already stock. we've already seen that play out three times, right? We've seen it with stock, and everybody went crazy. And then when it, when the transition from traditional work to the computer came over, and then everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, you're just going to press a button!" And now here we are, literally well, you, pressing a button. You and, saw it with uh, photography first. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, we've seen it true. multiple times. Every every single time, yeah. oh, TV's going to replace books. You know, uh, TV is yeah. going to get rid of the radio. It never, it never seems to do what everybody's scared that it's going to do. They were saying ten years ago that eBooks and and apps were going to replace books. Yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, take it from your senior illustrator uh, 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 people sitting in front of you here. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's still going to be, I think, this like you're saying, this need for bespoke like illustration and. In my newsletter recently, I was just like, you, the the problem isn't AI. The problem's IA, and IA stands for industrialized art. And this is something that's been happening since, you know, since forever. Is industry wants to pay the least amount possible for uh, for art, and and so that's why you saw you see Fiverr, you see stock illustration, and uh, and that's why like. Um, Social media, Mm -hmm. the whole thing with social media is let's sort of trick people into posting their art online for free uh, for exposure. Mm -hmm. And which is hilarious to me because in the artist community, everybody's saying, like, don't work for exposure, don't work for exposure, (laughs) you know, work for money. And yet every day people are posting their art online for exposure bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which which only can get you so far. I, I agree you need exposure, but. Um, so I want to ask you kind of transition into that social media. You're active on social media. You've got an Instagram account. You do Twitter. That's where I see most of you is, is on, is on Twitter. How, what's your relationship with social media? How do you use it as an illustrator? Or do you feel like, I'm just curious, like, is it working for you and what, what's making it work if so? Yeah, I, I so I came of age like I made my connections in the field when I was no one and knew no nobody before <laughs> social media, right? So to me, social media has always been an add-on to the thing I already had, right? right. And that's I think one thing that young people uh, that I'm, te- you know, I chair a graduate program in illustration, and they ask me, you know, how do I 
market myself? Is it a website? Is it Instagram? Is it Twitter? And yeah, of course, it's all those things. Um, to me, the, the social media is a passive form uh, of self-promotion. Like it, it goes out. You have no idea who sees it. You have no idea who reacts to it. Many times people who are faving your work on Instagram remember the image maybe, but they don't remember your name. They're not mm -hmm. logging it, you know, mentally as in this Rolodex of who's out there. Um, so I think you have to distinguish passive from active self-promotion if that's what, you know, we're interested in and you're talking about. And active self-promotion is always human relationship, one-to-one -one human relationship. So that means going to conferences or openings or, you know, God forbid, calling an art director on the <laughs> phone in their office and asking for a portfolio review, which seems extremely antiquated. Um, right. But almost all of the real connections I have in the industry are not these blind social media interactions. They're almost always connected to some kind of human relationship I've had with that person. Mm -hmm. I've served on a jury. I'm, I met them at a conference. We, you know, it's, so you just have to, you have to cultivate that part of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really building a network and that sounds very businessy and people don't like it. So if you don't like the idea of networking, just say professional friends, you know, mm -hmm. make professional friends and make that a part of your work. And so to me, social media has always been a thing that I do on top of that. Mm. That's super cool. How, how often do you find yourself like posting? Like what's your, do you have a, a strategy to that? Or is it just like, oh, I finished something, I'm going to post it. Or is it let, more detached and like, I've got, uh, I've got a schedule for the month and I'm going to post these many times. I got to promote this thing. I do, I do more when I have a book coming out and try to make mm -hmm. it regular uh, because, you know, the, the audience is always changing, it feels like. Um, mm -hmm. But I tend to make Twitter much more conversational. And, and I, I'm trying to embody the Twitter that I remember uh, from like 2012 that I really <laughs> love. Um, so I try to be the change I want to see in the world and yeah. uh, basically have fun. Um, and that's what's great about Twitter to me is it's all word based. So I, I just like generally talking on Twitter, mm -hmm. whereas Instagram is much more of a, an image friendly platform. Mm -hmm. But I, of course I do post images on, on both. I noticed you're not the guy who gets into flame wars on, on Twitter. Right. You're not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just like, I, I had a post go viral a uh, few days ago because uh, mm -hmm. I, I talked about AI and I was really just offering some thoughts. And of course mm -hmm. that, I think the algorithm knows <laughs> anyone talking about AI art is going to like, send your post through the roof. So I finally got some hate mail. Um, but, <laughs> what was but, your, yeah. what was your take on it? Uh, well, so I've been, um, reading this incredible, uh, book on cooking actually by Robert Farrar Capon. And, and I just, I just quoted this, um, this quote from the book. I despise recipes that promise results without work or success without technique. Mm. Technique must be acquired, and with technique, a love of the very process of cooking. No artist can simply long for results. He must like the work of getting them. That. Mm. So uh, to me, that's all about like, well, as we were talking about, people seeing an end use for art rather than seeing the process as being the art, right? And students mm -hmm. want to like get the result. But like 99% of your life is made making the stuff. So you just have to enjoy drawing. I, I, there's just no way around it if you're going to have a career in it to me. Mm -hmm. so, Wait, so, that, so was that was that the nature of your post that got the hate mail? Well, because they weren't really objecting to the the quote. It was just anything about AI. You know, people <laughs> are as long as you the, said it. <laughs> yeah. Coming in the mentions who are like, you're just afraid of technology. This is, <laughs> you know, you, you need to get on board with the 21st century, you Luddite. Um, mm -hmm. All that. I, I'm convinced <laughs> they're all Russian bots. So, uh, I mean, it's not without precedent, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but that goes to the idea that, you know, the person that has, and this is me, by the way, who had a guitar for like 10 years. And I, and I used to say, this is when I was uh, in high school, I really want to play the guitar. No, I didn't because I never didn't. did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, so I, I like the idea of 
of time warping to a to a time where I could play the guitar, skipping over all that pesky work, right? Yeah. So yeah, and and I challenge people when they say they really want something, and I'm like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, because it's because your life is being lived in a way that is the opposite of that. You don't want that, at least right now. Oh, well, I see students all the time who I think study illustration because they are interested mostly in the illustration content. Like mm-hmm. the illustration is the thing that allows them to get to the mm-hmm. content that they really love, but not the actual act of, of drawing and making. They're so, the last uh, ones to set up their, their paints and the first ones to pack up in class. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. And I don't think those are lost like souls. I, I don't think that means they won't be illustrated. Right. What I try to get them to unlock is like whatever that thing is, where you will sit down and do it with no one prompting you that, you know, if you can, if you can kind of dig in that spot, you, you'll mm-hmm. eventually find that kernel of the voice of the thing you want to continue to do. That's really good. That's really good. So you've been teaching uh, on top of all this of, of your illustration career. How, why do you teach? Not only <laughs> teaching, but he's the chair. He's right. got to like well, control yeah. all the teachers. How'd they sucker you into that? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I know. Every time uh, I'm at a meeting, I'm like, is this is this what I want to be doing with my life? Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I really do love, I love teaching. Uh, I, I'm not a pure introvert. You, you have to be some form of an introvert to make art because there's so much alone time. Mm-hmm. But I really do love getting out of the studio, mm-hmm. uh, being around young people who care about this stuff. Um and I, I, you know, they, they're inspiring, really. I mean, the, it's a way to stay in love with the field is to see new young people engaging with it. Um, you know, frankly, it's a way to see what is happening out there. I mean, it's very easy to get isolated in your own little bubble and just be like, no, I'm drawn with my with my hunts 102 for the next, you know, 30 years. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I have taught for um, 17, 18 years now. I did start this graduate program called MFA Illustration and Visual Culture, uh, very much, you know, a, a aspiring to make a program like I went to at SVA with Marshall Arisman. Uh, he had such a profound impact on on so many students that um, having some kind of graduate program that I could be a part of was really a, a kind of dream dream come true in a lot mm. of ways despite all the the administrative you know work that goes into it it really is it mm. really is worth worth my time I, cool. I, I, I we got to come clean with this guy Jake we we were we were very critical in a, in a past episode of MFA programs. That's true. And, you should and, challenge us on that. Well, and yeah. And so we were like, get, you know, it was like the three of us against the MFA world without, without a voice of reason coming in to defend it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, one of the things that we were saying is um, uh, a lot of the MFA programs that we've seen don't seem to be worth the the money and time and the results that come out of that from our friends that we've seen go in those programs yeah. are really disappointing. However, we did mention a few uh, programs that we really like, um, and uh, yeah. So, what do you what do you think yeah. about MFAs for the for the average illustrator who's gone through maybe a BFA or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I would probably agree with all of your criticisms, most likely. Uh, they are extremely expensive. Um, a lot of the times, I think students see them at or uh, schools see them as cash cows, as money makers. And so, um, you know, even the low residency programs are not that much cheaper than a full uh, residential program. So, uh, I, I think I would agree with all that. Um, I would say an MFA. If you are considering doing that, you have to count the cost, of course. Um, first of all, it is a terminal terminal degree, right? And you can teach with that in the field. Unfortunately, now to teach at a university in a vested position, a tenure tenure track position, you would need an MFA. So it is not it is not as much of a hood ornament degree as it mm-hmm. might appear to be from many years ago. Mm-hmm. Now that said, I think you're totally right. Um, you can't go into it thinking like, I'm going to sit in a hole and make my work for two years and pay $80,000 when I could do that in my basement. The whole point of education or liberal arts education is, you know, pursuit of truth, 
self-discovery, and cultivation of virtue. And those things happen in community. Your work always gets better in community. So if you think of a graduate degree as both the education, the time, the investment in one another, and also that professional network, like if you go somewhere, look at the faculty that you're going to be teaching you and what they do and who are they connected with? Because Mm -hmm. that frankly is what you're paying for as much as the education, Mm -hmm. because that professional network does not come easy. And in the illustration world, that's kind of the whole ball game. I mean, when I went to New York at SVA, I made connections there that I still use that, that, that set up a career for me that I would not have had without those investments in that network. And of course I had time to make my best work. It's, it's like all those things together. So you're just Mm. putting yourself in this bubble for two years, professional network, time to really explore your own ideas, uh, investment in, in a cohort of peers and faculty that are going to invest in you. And that, that is worth its weight in gold if you can do it right. So, but of course there are plenty, I think of predatory education programs out there. And I, I think people's skepticism is usually well placed. That was way too balanced and fair of an answer. <laughs> like, put that on Twitter and see. We how want that you to plays tell out. us that we're idiots and that we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're too level headed. Uh, that's no, that's great. You actually got me thinking. Like, maybe I should quit everything and do an MFA. For the yeah. Next hey, come to St. Louis. I can I can uh, tell you your portfolio would uh, would be very good. So we'll, we, we could give you a competitive offer. All right. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, your faith and how, like, what has compelled you or driven you to be so public about it with in your work and in, you know, online and social media? What's what's going on there? Yeah, it's it's such a good question. I, so. I really don't remember a time before I was drawing and before I had a faith in in Christianity and Jesus as a as like a real person that that lived and and was who he said he was. So, but I never wanted to make Christian work because mm-hmm. it was always like it was always just so so shitty. Like all the Christian <laughs> stuff was just so bad <laughs> that, that when I came to New York, I just was like, I'm going to be a real artist. I'm not going to make this schlock. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just didn't see a market that existed for that stuff. And then like I tell this to my students all the time, like if there's something that you care about deeply, you're not going to be able to keep it out of your work. Like it's, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but it's, it's going to infiltrate um, no matter what. So uh, of course the things we spend time thinking about and loving become our voice, become the things we want to write about. So over time, you know, I, I just, was interested in John Brown's story because he was this radical abolitionist who basically tried to single-handedly end slavery and, and almost did it, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, purely as an expression because he believed that the U S was not following the Bible correctly about how they were treating, you know, slaves. And then it extended into the story of, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the German pastor who tried to assassinate Hitler. And, and so these people's stories became things that I was interested in. Thank you. Um, Got to check out this book. It's awesome. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, so all, all that to say is that I, I never had never had a um, proselytizing agenda. It was it was truly just this is the stuff I was interested in and that made uh, it animated my my best work in a way. I mean, the collection of comics that I have about the Holy Ghost, those were all that came out last year. Um, And those were just like diary comics, basically, Mm -hmm. that I was doing for my own sort of confessional. And Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually I got enough of them where I'm like, this may have an audience. And and it certainly was not written for the church. You know, it was written for, I think, uh, doubters and skeptics uh, of which I am one. I mean, I I don't don't think you can have faith without serious doubt. Um, And so, yeah, I've been fortunate that a place like Abrams, which is not a Christian publishing company, um, Mm -hmm. has been very interested in in what I'm making for so many years. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because they just recently published a Joseph Smith graphic novel. So it's like 
mm-hmm. they're doing they're you know you did the the recently the book about christ like what was what was it called the um miracle man mm-hmm. miracle man miracle yeah. man yeah so it's it's interesting I, and you mentioned earlier too that um you had talked to david sailor but you ended up being published by abrams was david why did david give you a, a pass did he did he say on well i mean that's a very it, it's long. It's a good story. I mm-hmm. they bought my John Brown book on on mm-hmm. the first meeting. Like mm-hmm. I was like twenty five years old. I'm like this. Kids books are easy. I just sold <laughs> published a book to David Saylor on my first meeting, and we worked on that John Brown book at Scholastic for a year, and it went from two thousand words to like eight thousand words, and then finally they called me in one day and said we just can't make this book work in our in our world at Scholastic, mm-hmm. and they they dropped it. Mm. Uh, they gave me all the rights back to it. And then basically I went home and cried and was like, well, I had a great run. It's over. Oh, uh, wow. And actually that, th- that literal same day, uh, communication arts, the, the illustration and design magazine published a piece of hate mail about me, uh, from another illustrator. Yeah. What? And so my, my studio mate, Yuko Shimizu, I shared a studio with her. She was like, you are, you are not going to believe what's in CA as I come back from this David Saylor meeting. I'm like, well, I it's now I'm, I'm canceled basically. What, what was the hate mail? <laughs> so I was featured in their section of uh, fresh, which was like, you know, their uh, kind of up and coming artist section. Mm-hmm. And then another well-known illustrator who I'll not name wrote an article saying that I was basically ripping off Jack Unruh, who it's was so funny. That you, it's so funny that you said that because when I looked at your work, I saw the influence but it's oh, so 100%. different. It's 100%. it's like a, there's some homage to Jack Unra in your work. Yeah. And in, yeah. <laughs> well, and he went to Wash U where I, I currently teach. Uh, oh. and so we were we've got to know each other over the years before he uh, died a few Absolutely, years ago. Yeah. But anyway, I, so that's that thing where you're like, I do. I mean, I really am influenced by his work. So it was like, oh, no. Oh, like maybe I am hewing too close. And mm-hmm. so it's just that moment where you doubt everything about yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And. You know, the the good news was my good friend, Yuko, she was way more famous than me at the time and got all these famous illustrators to write in on my behalf and say, this is crazy, first of all. And second of all, why are you publishing hate mail about a young illustrator? Right. <laughs> and it was like Christoph Neiman and um, and Tomer Hanuka and uh, Marcos Chin all got these letters published. So it ended up being like a really big encouragement. That's um, cool. Wow. Yeah. And That's and I, cool. I eventually took the book around to every house I had a connection with in New York, and mm-hmm. and finally ended up at Abrams. Uh, and it it was uh, it was the rest of the story. I've I've never written for anyone else uh, mm-hmm. besides Abrams. That's cool. The way I I first found your work was the um, the Sunday drawings that you're doing in your sketchbooks. You were mm. posting those. I I don't know if I saw them on a blog or if they were posted on Drawn or something like that. And uh, and I just always thought that was cool. I was like, is he actually paying attention to the sermon? <laughs> or <Yeah>. is he? <laughs> well, you know how it is. I, if I'm watching someone talk, uh, mm-hmm. I just, my brain mm-hmm. evacuates. I, I don't know what it is. Just, but when it I wanders, drawing, yeah. I, I just, the drawing unlocks the ability to listen to me. So, mm-hmm. you know, listening to that sermon, just treating it like it's improv and just yes, anding everything that I, that I hear. Uh, and of course the Bible is just rich with extremely weird imagery. Mm-hmm. So there is just a lot to play with metaphorically. Um, you know, and they don't, they don't always work. Of course. I, I mean, I only show everyone the ones that look amazing. So people think every time <laughs> I sit down, I just do this incredible drawing and, mm-hmm. You know, I've gotten better at it over the years where I got a higher percentage than usual. But, mm-hmm. you know, just like every drawing, there's there your sketchbook should have a bunch of crappy things in it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're, you're probably not really doing it right. You're you know, it's just mm-hmm. this touring portfolio of your own work. Right. Right. That's something I've I've uh, I had to relearn again. I went to this phase where the sketchbook had to be a portfolio. And I'm and the last couple of years I've been relearning. No, let's use it to explore. And yeah. to yeah. fail and trip up and, and not every drawing has to be like, Oh, I remember those days and... when I would, if I did a bad drawing in my sketchbook, I would take the exacto knife and just like laser cut the page out. <laughs> I'd be like, no one ever knows I do a bad drawing. Yeah. 
I think they should. I mean, they, they should really look terrible. If people, I always tell my students, if the, if the sketchbook looks good, that means you're drawing what you've already drawn or what you already know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That said, I um, just (laughs) got a brand new sketchbook and it's untouched. And so that first page, I've just been looking at it for like three days. No, and just you got to start, you got to <laughs> skip two or three pages, mm-hmm. start two or three pages in, and then you have to like run it over with the car. Like yeah, there's it's, that's perfect. something that drops I like throwing comments. some collage in there and just like, you know, yeah. just get something going. But yeah, that, that, that blank sketchbook's tough. But I do remember in, in, in college seeing a lot of the, the students would be like, whoops, they drop their sketchbook and it opens and it's so beautiful. Like, oh my God, you're so oh, good. You guys, this is just my little doodles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doodling this morning. <laughs> I have another book of yours too I want to talk about. It's called Drawing is Magic. Mm. And t- where did this come from? T- how did this happen? Tell us well, what it is well, and, and, and how you made it. it. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I it's a book that's very close to my heart in that I really found who I was by using my sketchbook. Uh, and it happened in graduate school. Uh, I was a person who my graduate school director noticed that all the stuff I pinned up in my studio looked different than the work I was making. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that flowed freely out of me was my drawings. And yet I felt like I should be painting because painting was the correct way to make good illustration or what, you know, we all have these weird liturgies in our head of like, well, good art is this kind of thing. Um, so drawing was always the thing that unlocked who I really was. And I, I built this course at WashU called the Illustrator Sketchbook, which was just making illustrators draw all the time to the point where they can't think if it's good or bad. They just are making. Mm-hmm. And after 10 years of teaching that course, I realized this is like a really great book. So I, I turned that course into kind of a philosophy of drawing where instead of a classic drawing book that teaches you, here's how to draw a horse or a hand it's about how you make ideas and how you free yourself up from like worrying about making accurate drawings. Like, cause accuracy is just not what drawing is really. Mm -hmm. And if you make drawing an expression of thinking, right. If drawing is thinking more than it is representing things that are either right or wrong, it just changes what drawing is for you. Because for me, I don't get an idea and then draw it. That's what people think happens. To me, ideas mm-hmm. come from the act of drawing. Mm-hmm. So the, the quicker you can get into just moving the pen across the page, that is the thing that creates ideas. But but most people get locked up because they're like, what if I put the line in the wrong place? What mm-hmm. if I don't like the hand? What what if it looks weird? And then they're just it's a, it's a cycle that they're trapped in this kind of frozen feeling of of where the pen is actually the enemy, you know, and and. And that's what that's what changed my work, and it's something that I try to teach young people about. That's awesome. But, yeah, that's cool. I yeah, I honestly haven't drawn in that book because it's so pretty. I don't want to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, well, I don't want to mess book, it up. Book, I should have said that it's a book you're meant to draw in, and right. it's you know meant for children. I mean, it's 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 aimed at middle grade. And mm-hmm. so you put it in a library and kids like draw on it. It's a perfect thing for me because then the library has to get a new copy. So it's like a self uh, <laughs> generating loyalty. Right. Book. So mm-hmm. it's called drawing is magic, discovering yourself in a sketchbook. And like, I just opened up to a rad- random page. It says you're, you're going on a scavenger hunt. Take your spe- sketchbook to a place with a lot of people like a mall or downtown cafe district. Draw anyone that fits into the prompts. And then there's a bunch of prompts, a woman in a hat, a person with expensive tastes, someone in a hurry, someone who wants to be somewhere else. Like that's, this honestly is, if you don't know what to draw in your sketchbook, Lee, just open up to one of these pages and, and that should be page one. Like draw your name in these expressive ways, cute, angry, nervous, frumpy. How much of this was like ready to go for the book and how much of it were you like, Oh, I, I have like 50 more pages. I got to come up with ideas. Oh, I, I kind of, I, one thing I realized when I published that book is I, I blew all the content I had in one book. I probably could have stretched that over three <laughs> volumes and just had a lot more white paper for kids to draw on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I have a lot of assignments that even get into that book. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And and it was a matter of, of kind of curating what would work. What's hilarious is this is a class that was designed for college students. 
And yet the same prompts are the things that 11 year olds struggle with, right? Like mm -hmm. I've got a blank page. I don't know what to do. How do I, how do I create an idea for a comic? Like I want to draw something, but I don't know what that thing is. And so a lot of it is just like false limitations, you know, teaching people how to create limitations to make your ideas come quicker and, and clearer, which limitations always do. It's way easier to come up with an idea under the constriction of it's a robot and a tiger and they're having an argument versus mm -hmm. make a comic about something funny, right? Like the, <laughs> right. <laughs> the, first, the first prompt immediately gives you ways that you can solve that. And, and that takes you to new creative destinations. So it's, it's, um, it's tricks I've found over the years to, to help young people unlock that, that way to think and draw. Mm -hmm. So your most recent book is go and do likewise. Is that, that that was my most recent picture book, and then I have a collection of comics called uh, "The Holy Ghost: The oh. Spirited Comic." Yeah. Okay, so I'm just curious. You the you kind of said the Holy Ghost was uh, notebook things that or, or sketchbook stuff, and you're like, wait, there might be an audience. How mm -hmm. did you go from there might be an audience to book deal? It, uh, and, so th these are these are like theology comics, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, the Holy Ghost, which is a little blue ghost and a squirrel. And it's sort of like when you read Calvin Hobbes and they're in the wagon and they're talking about philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's like that moment for an entire book. So like the two overlapping audiences of comics and theology is like the smallest little sliver, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I assume that my publisher Abrams Comics arts they they do really i mean they crumb is in their catalog uh they weren't, weren't going to be interested so i sent it to a little tiny publisher they wanted to do it uh it was a christian publisher in nashville <clears throat> and then but we had to get abrams to sign off of on, on because they have for, right of first refusal and they looked at it and they're like no we want this for sure and mm -hmm. uh made a huge offer on it which i was basically not even doing that with the other publisher so it, I, I was completely stunned by it my agent was stunned we were just like i can't believe this is something they want to do um and it it fit with their with with my work you know of course that's one of the benefits of of staying with one publisher is your new books help sell the other books the back the backlist Right. Um, so I think publishers can see you as well. It would it would behoove us to publish this because it will help float some of these other books that are also in our in our catalog. Cool. And yeah. then uh, go and do likewise. What? Why that book and why why now? Yeah, they both of those picture books, the Miracle Man and Go and Do Likewise, as we're kind of from the same. Uh, the same cinematic universe, uh, so to speak. The, the, the <laughs> I JCU. To yeah, that's right. <laughs> the JCCU. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to revisit the uh, the world that I made for Miracle Man, and um, the, a lot of kids and, and parents wanted more from that that telling because uh, Miracle Man tells the story of Jesus almost like it's a tall tale. You know, he's not even named in the book until the very mm -hmm. end, and it allows you to sort of enter the story from without some of the trappings of what we think the story means and so mm -hmm. i wanted to do the same thing with some of the parables which i just think it's not really talked about or thought about in the way that jesus was like like an artist he he was making art when he was telling these stories you know mm -hmm. he was the, the stories do more for the principle that he was trying to illuminate than if he had just said hey you should do these four things right the, yeah. the story actually creates both mystery and clarity at the same time. And I just love that about art. Like it's a thing that art can do that nothing else can. Uh, and so the the parables were always something I wanted to explore uh, visually and narratively. So that that was the reason for that book. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Cool. You guys, I, I ran out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um. I have a question. But I got to go at 11 anyway. So, yeah. Okay. I, I really want to know, um, because we, I, I always try to, to listen to um, our guests as if I was one of our listeners, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and as you, you're a teacher, I know you'll have some good answers for this. Like, you, you said earlier um, that, you know, you said... Uh, your your some of your most your best success has been in the personal meetings that you've had the personal contacts and stuff what if we've got somebody listening that 
they live so far out somewhere or in another country and they just feel like they can't make those personal contacts, what would be your best advice for them to see success as a, as an illustrator? And that might not be, well, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I really think that is, that is hard. I think right now a lot of people are struggling with that feeling of isolation um, in our work, in our community, what, whatever that may be. Social media is not a replacement for human interaction. You know, it's just not. And it's a way to extend what, what we already have into that space. So I always tell people if they're not around a hub, a major hub in New York or L.A. or whatever it is, I guarantee that there are people in your area that are interested in what you're interested in. And, and a good old fashioned drink and draw together is just so fun. And you go to, it it doesn't have to be beer. It could be coffee, whatever it is, get six or seven people around a table. You get a drink, you have your sketchbook and you just work, but in community. And it's that feeling of like, not being stuck with your work, but also having one another to bounce ideas off of mm. uh, that kind of thing in concert with your own private work and writing and time and isolation and reflection. Um, to me, that's the secret to a rich creative life is is the combination of, of fellowship and community along with that personal alone time. And you just, I don't think you can have one or the other. I think you need both to make your best work. So trying to find that community, whether it's SCBWI or uh, a local chapter of, um, you know, an, a, a small press club or w- whatever that thing is, you know, try to find those people that are interested in it uh, in your area. All right. That's cool. All right. Well, I think we'll Lee, Did you have anything else? Um, what's, I don't know if he can talk about it, but what's the next couple of projects that you're, that you're, that's, that's brewing, but hasn't, you haven't started yet. Well, I, that's a great question. I am in year four of a graphic novel I'm working on about the friendship between uh, J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Um, and it's called The Myth Makers. And, you know, these two Tweety academics in their 50s, like accidentally reinvented um, fantasy literature uh, forever. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, th- their their friendship is incredible. The work they made is incredible. And also I'm I'm kind of making it a thumbnail history of the fairy tale and, and myths, you know, why does, why does humanity tell myths at all? Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a tall order to, to cram into a book. Uh, I've never done a dual biography before, let alone the history of the fairy tale. Um, Wait, so that's real. That's real. They were friends and yeah. Oh yeah. They were, they were best friends. Yeah. I, I didn't mean, know that. Yeah. I have this, they, had this, they had this dramatic, uh, you know, falling out the end of their, their life. I mean, T- Tolkien would never have finished Lord of the Rings without Lewis. Mm-hmm. And Tolkien basically converted Lewis to Christianity from hard atheism, uh, which unlocked, of course, his whole career's writing. So their their lives and writings are so intertwined. It's uh it's a it's a real fascinating story. I read I this thing. Some someone had written, or I don't, I don't know where I got this from, but it, the Lord of the Rings essentially was written on Tuesday nights because Wednesdays, uh, Tolkien had a meeting with, with Lewis and he had to show him pages. <laughs> and so yeah. that's, that's the whole thing about community, man. They, they <laughs> the things that the reading group was, was critical to, to their work mm. being done and encouraging one another. I mean, Tolkien was such a perfectionist. He would, he would revise and revise and revise. And he needed someone like Lewis to say like, just, just you're be done with it. You, you've right. done the work, move to the next thing. I want to read more, you know? Yeah. You haven't been working on the Silmarillion again. Come on, get this yeah, uh, right. get this Lord of the Rings out. What was their falling out about? So it, it came towards the end of their life, and Lewis married um, a woman, and in secret, basically, Joy Davidman, uh, who he'd met, you know, through writing letters. And she, he didn't tell Tolkien about it, and Tolkien was very hurt. And, you know, they were famously, Tolkien was a Catholic, and Lewis was a, an Anglican. And their their denominational differences never cropped up in their life. And then towards the end of their life, it, it they began to conflict about, like, can you marry someone who is divorced? Because Joy Davidman was divorced. Mm-hmm. Well, she was divorced because her husband was abusive. And so just like British men, they never really talked about it. They just, mm-hmm. like, began to stop having fellowship in the same way. 
Mm. And then right towards the end of their life, they did, you know, reconcile. But Good. in many ways, their story is extremely interesting because of the conflict. And it kind of illuminates a lot about what was underneath their writing and their history. That's wow. cool. Yeah. Wow. You, you might appreciate this. I was in a rare books shop in Provo, Utah, and uh, I was talking to the book owner and he's like, oh, check this out. I got something to show you. He had in his hand, like in his shop, um, Tolkien's Bible. Whoa, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and he said, look at this. And, and he started flipping through and there were notes in the Bible for Lord of the Rings. Oh man, oh, wow. well, that's yeah. a that is a million dollar piece of item there. That's a, that's right. amazing. He told me too, like because he was telling me about his whole thing, you know, and and uh, you know he collect religious books and fantasy books and all that stuff. And and he said when I found out about this book that it was available, uh, someone called me and I said, okay, I'll be there um, tonight. And wow. he got in his car and he drove like cross country, <laughs> like however many <laughs> states away so that he could like pay the guy cash for the book. Um, Cause he, it wasn't time to get a flight or anything. He just got in his car and, wow. and drove out to get it. So, um, so yeah, fascinating stuff. Well, wow. John, thank you. I know let, you got to go. This was let me, good. Let me, can I throw one quick question? This is He's a quick He's got thing. another, he's got to go, Will. He wants to answer this one though. Okay. <laughs> no, John, I want is there anything like, like that you haven't done that you've got to do in your mm. career? Something that you've just got a project you've got to get done. Man, I always wanted to do a postage stamp. I don't know if I'm ever going to do it or not. <laughs> but that and the New Yorker cover, I, it is the, those are like. I don't think there's any way you can try. It just has to happen, you know. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Pray, okay. pray for my New Yorker cover. How's that? Okay. All right. Or and and I'll pray for mail. your stamp too. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this is awesome. And uh, yeah, we just appreciate, I, you know, I speak for all three of us and all of our listeners too. We, this is a great conversation. We appreciate you uh, giving up your time for us. And I'm a big fan, guys. Keep it up. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. That was good. That was really good. Yeah. <clears throat> he's, he's amazing. Um, what an inspirational kind of, I think he's got his head on right with the AI. Everybody's worried about the output. But he's worried mm -hmm. about being. Oh, well, maybe we should save this for the for the wrap. <laughs> just, just go for it. Well, he's just like he's focused on the process, and that's kind of where I'm starting to land on it. But he was more elegant in how he said it. Um, you know, it's 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 the idea of making stuff, and and you know, we've got a centuries of making stuff, and I don't think all of a sudden now it's like okay, art's over. There's no more making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it really will be a process. I mean, I tell you what's intimidating about all that AI stuff is that it's, it's just so polished and so finished, but, but really, um, that's maybe the humanity of, of making stuff is, is what people are interested in, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's going to, that's going to trump it. So it'll, so eventually it'll be a tool. It's just a really nice tool. His, I his mean, work is so organic. It's, it's it hard. couldn't be replaced with the AI. It's hard to see, and with the type that he integrates, um, that's not going to happen. There's if they can't, if the AI can't do fingers, it's not going to be able to do type for a while. They can't do type either. <laughs> Anytime type shows up, it's it's you know some mix between Doctor Seuss and acrylic or whatever. You know, yeah. well, um, may, and we might be selling the AI short, and I mean, and it's going to improve, but the feel, the fingerprint that he has on his work mm -hmm. is so. Or I can't think of another better word than organic, you know? Well, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's engaging too. Like yeah. you, you do kind of get lost in his illustrations. And I love, I love that he's doing a graphic novel of, of Tolkien and Lewis. That's going to be a bestseller. Mm. If, Dude, I, you know. I want to read it now just because I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For real. Well, I'm going to take us out. Uh, everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I just wanted you to check out, if you haven't already, check out johnhendricks.com. That's his website. You can follow him on Twitter. He's a good follow on Twitter. He's posts pretty frequently on Instagram. So you're going to, you're going to like having his stuff in your feed. Um, thank you for joining us today. Three point perspectives made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts are Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. You can find Will Terry's work at willterry.com. 
You can find Lee White at LeeWhiteIllustration.com and you can find my work at MrJakeParker.com. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's DanielTU.co. Special thanks to Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Show Notes, Show Notes Wrangler, Lily Howell, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott. Now go draw something. <laughs>